Well, hello, everybody. You are very welcome back to our lectures. So you're in week two right now. And in week two, well, you now probably have a pretty good idea what this course is about. And hopefully you have a better idea on the habits you need for success. If you want any suggestions from me, being uh, the, your host for this, for this course for the semester. And I talked about the importance of study groups. So if you have not made a study group yet, I suggest you do. Not only does it help to keep you, I guess you can say, uh, uh, accountable for your learning, but on the same hand also, it gives you someone or people to bounce ideas back and back and forth on. I know that many of you, many of you uh, reach out to me and as you probably have noticed, my delay, my responses are rather delayed because I get lots of lots of questions. So it's a great resource if you you guys can help each other. Now, um, another note is if any of you are having problems uploading things, I I talk to some of you, but make sure that you also reach out to me to make sure that week two, all your assignments are submitted according to protocol. And yes, thank you also for, for, uh, for being a great students for the first, first week. This online experience is new for lots of us and it's not something that I'm, I'm really comfortable yet either. And uh, many of you have sent me feedback. I really do uh, appreciate it. You may not get the answer you want, but know that I will always listen and I will try to I will, I will try to respond the best that I can. All right, well, without further ado, we're gonna talk about hormones. And here we go. So chapter seven is going to be all about mostly the endocrine system, but first let's go ahead and define what a hormone is. And it is a Chemical messenger, very similar to what we talked about in chapter six. Chemical messenger, meaning that it is going to bind with some kind of receptor and it is transported through the blood. That means is that hormones generally act on a large number of cells and they generally create systematic wide responses. Now, we have, we have different classes of hormones here. And we're gonna separate them into extracellular. Or we're also gonna separate them into intracellular. Extracellular hormones are usually going to be protein-based or They are protein-based. Proteins, as you recall, cannot passively diffuse through the cell membrane. They must use transporters. That's inefficient. So the extracellular messengers bind with surface receptors. So they're going to bind with surface receptors on the cell membrane. And there's two classes. One is going to be called a peptide. A peptide is a protein, so it's made up of a chain of amino acids. So these are big hormones. And the other one, which is a little bit more, more palatable, is called an amine. This is a modified amino acid. Usually it's going to be tyrosine or tryptophan, but it is a modified amino acid, meaning that the, the amino acid is going to be the template and using that template, it's going to be made into a, a hormone of some sort. Now the next is intracellular. This means that it's going to diffuse through the cell membrane and it is going to bind with something inside the cell. And these are based on the 
substance called cholesterol, which you probably see on the back of many food, food labels. But cholesterol is actually very essential because it, is, because it is used to make a certain class of hormones called lipids. And these are small nonpolar molecules that can freely diffuse through the cell. And these bind through what is called intracellular receptors, meaning that there are receptors inside the cell that they, that they bind with. Now, we're gonna talk about each, each, each class just to kind of give you an idea. So I'm gonna erase this. And the first thing we are gonna talk about is a peptide hormone. As I just told you, peptide hormones are protein-based. They are protein-based. And they need to be made through a process called transcription and translation. You might, re you might remember these from bio. Transcription, translation. And if you're like, oh my gosh, it's been eons since I've taken bio. That's okay, I got your back. So I'm gonna draw here, I'm going to draw a half of a cell. Um, it's gonna be a very big cell. Not gonna be a pretty cell, but it will be a cell. There we go. And I'm going to draw here something called a nucleus, which of course you remember from your bio days. Nucleus, it is surrounded by a nuclear envelope, nuclear membrane. It's got pores in it, so on and so forth. These pores allow things to enter and exit, in case you want a bio lesson here. We know that DNA, the giant molecule containing all of our genetic information, everything included how to build us, is encased in this DNA. We have 4.4 billion nucleotides. That's a lot. Those 4.4 billion nucleotides have information for making lots of genes. A gene is a segment of DNA that codes for a protein, just one gene. And I kind of compare DNA to a gigantic recipe book. And each gene is just one, one recipe. For the gene for making a certain uh, peptide hormone, it just is one page in that gigantic recipe book. So there's a process called transcription where a molecule called messenger RNA is just going to copy one tiny part of the DNA. I'm talking like this thing is 4.4 billion nucleotides. Well, in, instead a gene might be uh, maybe 3,500 nucleotides. 20,000 nucleotides, so it is a tiny fraction. Now, kind of going out here is there is um, what's, and the things inside the cell are called organelles. This is called the rough endoplasmic reticulum. I'm gonna draw it like this, because it is folded, it is layered. As we talked about is in physiology, surface area is very important. If you fold things, you can maximize surface area. And these things I'm drawing in black here are going to be ribosomes. Ribosomes are the, are the things that where trans, translation occurs. So what's gonna happen is that this messenger RNA, keep in mind when messenger RNA is made, that's called transcription. When the information from the DNA is passed on to the messenger RNA. It's going to go to the rough ER, and that's when translation is going to happen, where the, the uh, give me one second here, make sure I'm with the study guide. Um, uh, that is where the process called translation is going to happen. So trans, translation takes the code in the, DNA, in the, in the messenger RNA and use that information to build a protein. So we're gonna have here the protein. It's gonna draw here. What's interesting is that this, this protein that's, that's made 
And I think I'm kind of, yeah, I'm kind of jumping ahead here, but that's okay. I'll make, make sure that we go back and verify it. What's, what's interesting here is that when, trans, when translation first happens, we call this thing called a pre pro formal. And we call that this is a protein, it is a peptide. And what's interesting about this is that it's going to have a segment on it called a signal. It is a group of amino acids that act as a signal. And then you are going to have the active hormone, which I'm drawing in blue. Actually, I take that back. It is currently inactive. It is kept off. So I'm going to just draw a line here. This is the inactive hormone. Please recall that all hormones have a half-life. The moment that it is active, it is going to begin the process of uh, already de degrading. Hormones have a very specific half-life. We're also going to have um, proteins here that are going to keep the hormone inactive. So we're just going to call these um, peptide fragments or just proteins. Now the purpose of this, this signal molecule, it is going to help, it is going to help it go through the rough ER and it is in, and it is going to go into a vesicle. Now when it goes into the vesicle, it is going to lose that signal molecule. So the signal molecule is going. So signal is going to be cleaved off. So what is what is what is going to be to be left now is now we have something called a prohormone. So once it once it works its way through the rough ER, it is going to become a pro-hormone. The signal is going to be cleaved off. So what's going to be in this, this vesicle here is now called a pro-hormone. So the signal's gone. All we have are the, is uh, uh, the inactive hormone Just like this. And these are going to be the peptide fragments. That's going to be the inactive hormone. So the so the the hormone is still very inactive. So I'm gonna draw another organelle here. Uh, it kind of has a couple of different names. In high school, if you're if you're old and ancient like me, you may recall it being called the Golgi apparatus. I think now they just kind of prefer Golgi. I don't know. It's kind of like, kind of like uh, there's a trend where if someone's really famous, they don't say their first and last name anymore. They just say their first name. Like when I, when I went to Vegas a couple years back, I just see Garth. Like he's the only Garth in the world. And of course it shows him looking all, I don't know, like how Garth Brooks would look when he's trying to look cool. And yeah, I'm like, huh, that's, that's interesting. So now it's like, not the Golgi apparatus, just Golgi. So here we are, welcome to 2020. When nothing makes sense anymore. Actually, this, this happened well before 2020, but I'll just blame it on 2020 because that's the default now. Sorry, I'm completely digressing. What's gonna happen here is that this vesicle is going to travel to the Golgi. And if you recall, the Golgi's job is to store and then secrete. Now, what's gonna happen is that when it is, when it is released from, the, from the, the Golgi, it's going to go back into a vesicle, but in, in the vesicle it's going to be given an enzyme. 
So it's going to be given an enzyme. And now our pro, pro hormone, which I'll go ahead and keep in pink. What this enzyme is going to do is it is going to cleave off the active hormone from the peptide. What's going to happen here is that well the well the pro hormone is in the, the vesicle this enzyme is going to cleave off the the peptides from the from the uh, 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 the inactive hormone so if I'm gonna you know what it's kind of confusing I'm gonna go ahead I'm going to draw it in orange and blue so now once this happens the inactive hormone is now going to be active. And then it is going to leave the cell via exocytosis. And you are going to have both the peptide fragments and you are going to have the active hormone diffuse out of the cell. So now we are going to have, I'm going to say both here, active hormone. All right, so I'm going to use this time to um, re review what, what, what we just did. So peptides are proteins. They are, they are synthesized in the ribosomes. For multicelled eukaryotic life forms like us, usually our cells um, are, it's going to be synthesized on the rough endoplasmic reticulum, rough ER. Recall a peptide is many amino acids combined to form a long chain of amino acids. We call that a peptide. Because of that, this has to be synthesized. So what's, what's, what's gonna happen is that it is going to be synthesized, because this is also on the study guide, it is going to be synthesized on the rough ER. This is going to be synthesized, meaning created. So I guess you can say this is the first stage. It's going to be stored in the Golgi because the Golgi stores things. And then it is going to be released when the Golgi packages it in the vesicle and sends it to diffuse out via exocytosis. All right, so now you know the stages uh, peptide hormone synthesis. You also know the, uh, the, the, the steps needed to synthesize the pre-pro hormone and then when it secretes it's now active hormone. Active hormones have a, have a half-life. You only want it to be active once it leaves the cell. It's kind of like if you're, if you're going trick-or-treating and you have a glow stick. If you still go trick-or-treating, if you're my age and do it, no, no judgment. You only want to activate the glow stick when you're ready to go outside and, and begin your journey. You don't want to activate it when you first buy it from the store because it would then turn off. It would degrade. Same exact thing with hormones. You only want to be active when they are released. Okay, so I'm going to give you guys a short break here and um, yeah, just come back in five minutes. Go ahead and stretch and I don't know, go get a snack or like me, monster energy. All right, see you guys in a couple of minutes. Okay, everyone, well, we are back. We're going to talk now about lipid-based hormones. And lipid-based hormones are going to be synthesized from a molecule called cholesterol. And this is a very important compound that is derived from the diet, meaning that your body really needs to consume foods containing cholesterol so they can use it to modify and create something called steroid hormones. So cholesterol is the basis for what is called a steroid hormone. These are turned into steroid hormones.
And there's not a whole lot of steroid hormones in the body. Uh, three that, that come to mind immediately is going to be um, cortisol, which is secreted by the adrenals. Testosterone, which is secreted from the gonads. And also estrogen, which is secreted from the ovaries. These are three examples of steroid hormones. And these are also freely diff diffusible through the cell membrane because we call that small nonpolar molecules are freely diffusible. So that means is that steroid hormones travel through the blood on something called a protein carrier. Because of course, this is lipid based. So it's not going to do well when just in water. So it's on a protein based carrier. So I'm going to go ahead and draw these in purple. But what's going to happen is that they are, are going to, to disassociate with the protein transporter and they are going to diffuse into the cell. And it is going to bind to what is called an intracellular receptor. Um, once it goes onto the intracellular receptor, what it's going to do is it is going to move into the nucleus. And when that happens is it is going to under or it is going to stimulate the process of transcription and translation. Usually what steroid hormones do is that they're going to be responsible in the synthesis of a new protein. I say that usually, not always. Now on occasion, you also can have intracellular receptors in the nucleus, which in that case, it just by, by, bypasses the, the cytoplasmic intracellular receptor and instead this goes straight to the, um, the, inter the intracellular receptor contained in the nucleus. So this is how steroid-based hormones work. They're derived from, from cholesterol. So cholesterol is the foundation that's modified to become a steroid hormone. A couple of examples are cortisol from the adren adrenals, testosterone from the testes, estrogen from the ovaries, I think for testosterone, I said gonads before. Yeah, that's, that's, that's technically correct, but more specifically, uh, the testes. But you will not be tested on where testosterone or estrogen are, are synthesized. All right, so what happens is that when they are secreted, they're going to bind to an intracellular re receptor. Um, so they are, are going to be carried, apologies, they are going to be carried on protein transporters. They're, they're going to disassociate. And they're going to bind with intracellular receptors. Then those intracellular receptors are going to um, either go into the nucleus or in, or in other situations, the, the, the hormone will diffuse and this goes straight into the nucleus. So one of the two. All right, well, this is steroid hormones. All right, everyone, so we're now going to talk about amine hormones. And as I was saying earlier, amine hormones, they are modified amino acids. They are not peptides. We call that the goal of transcription translation is you are trying to build a peptide with amine hormones, you are just taking in amino acid and modifying it. So I'll just put down modified AA for amino acid. And we generally talk about two different types of amine hormones. And the first one is going to be called tyrosine. And the other one is going to be called tryptophan. I know that if you go to any kind of a vitamin shop is that 
is that tryptophan is sometimes advertised to increase mood, and that's because, because tryptophan is actually modified to make the neurotransmitter serotonin. Just to give you an example of that. Now, as far as an amine, amine hormone goes, we have a couple. Uh, so first of all, we have the catecholamines. I'll just put this as a category. Catecholamines. And those two are going to be epinephrine and norepinephrine. Or if you're in the UK, adrenaline and noradrenaline. Why am I writing adrenaline? Epinephrine. Uh, the difference is, is that norepinephrine is a neurotransmitter and epinephrine is a hormone. Another example of tyrosine is going to be the hormone called thyroid hormone. Well, it's not called thyroid hormone, but we'll just keep it general for now. Lastly, we're going to have dopamine. So those are all modified from tyrosine. And, and amine hormones are what we call um, extracellular messengers. And examples of that are going to be, for example, GPCRs or ligand channels. All right, so now we have talked about the amines, and next we're, we're going to talk about the fun part of class, and that is going to be endocrine pathways. Okay, everyone, so we're gonna talk now about control of hormone release, which is very important. Control of hormone release. So hormones are very powerful chemical messengers because they can more or less target almost every cell in the body. Several, many cells have receptors for them and they promote wide range systematic responses. So this needs to be tightly regulated. And we need to, main, to maintain levels. We need to maintain homeostasis. Homeostasis is a preferred set point of a circulating hormone. Well, it has other definitions too, but in this case, the preferred set point of a circulating hormone. And the body does a very good job of ensuring that homeostasis is maintained. If it is not, it means that something pretty drastic is wrong with the pathway. Um, now, if you've ever gotten blood work done, you probably have seen that you have a range. Like for example, let's say your doctor wants to test your thyroid hormone. It has a range. That range is on average sort of a variance of each, each person's preferred levels of thyroid hormone. And if it is outside of that, that range, then uh, usually there's cause for, for concern. That's also why, let's say you get a test result back and it's just on the edge of the range or just over, usually the doctor is not going to be overly alarmed. And that's because you're still kind of within that range, maybe a little bit out of it, but it's more like if you're way out of it, then, they, then that's when, when therapeutic options are normally dis discussed. So anyways, the goal is to maintain homeostasis, and we do that through a tightly controlled system called a feedback arc. So that is, is called a feedback arc. And the idea of the feed, feedback arc is that it's going to do a, do a series of steps to maintain homeostasis. So let's talk about the the, the different terminology here that, that we'll, we'll be using through the rest of the chapter. And the first is going to be something called a stimulus. And a stimulus is going to be a change 
in the system. What that change is, is usually the levels of a hormone or levels of a substance. So it's going to be change. Stimulus is change. Now, I'll just do change in hormone to be a little bit more clear in this case. Now the sensor is going to detect that change. So the sensor is going to detect circulating levels. Detect circulating levels. So it's constantly tasting the blood, determining the levels of the hormone or substance in question. Then we have what is called the integrating center, what I also call as the thinking center. Integrating center, also known as the thinking center. And what this does is it determines release of hormone. So what it is, is the integrating center is going to think and think, okay, well, how much of my hormone do I, do I need to secrete? Next is going to be the target. The target is going to receive hormone. Now the target response Target response is going to be the hormone actions. So what is it going to do? And then the systematic re response, and I'm color coding this for a very good reason. Systematic response is going to be, um, going to be the change in hormone, hopefully to restore homeostasis. So let's, let's go through a very simple arc. And this is a, a simple arc because the, the endocrine cell, meaning what, sec, what sec, secretes the hormone, that's also going to be the sensor. So here we're gonna have a simple arc and it is going to be parathyroid hormone. Parathyroid hormone has, has one job and that is to increase levels of calcium. So let's say the stimulus in this case is going to be decreased levels of circulating calcium. That is a big no-no because we really need calcium in the blood to do a number of very important processes. Okay, so the sensor in this case is going to be the parathyroid cells. They are going to sense the levels of calcium. What they are, are going to do is that since, since it is also the integrating center, so also underline it in orange to imply that it's also the integrating center. What it's going to do is it is going to increase levels uh, let me let me kind of write this off to the to the side. It is going to increase secretion of parathyroid hormone or PTH. This is going to act on bone because what is the main, main reservoir of calcium in our body? And that is going to be bone. What's going to happen is that, um, uh, is, is that what, what parathyroid hormone is going to do is it is going to break down bone and it is going to increase circulating levels. Well, actually, let me, let me make this a little bit more consistent. 
it is going to increase catabolism of bone. And then the systematic response is going to be increased CA2 plus levels. All right, so basically what, what this is, it is a simple pathway, parathyroid hormone release. When calcium gets too, too low, it's going to be sensed by the, the parathyroid cells since it is also the integrating center, it is going to sense the calcium levels and it is going to determine how to alter secretion of the hormone called parathyroid hormone. In this case, it's going to increase it. It's going to act on bone, so that's going to be the target and the target res response is going to be catabolism of bone. The systematic response is going to be the change in hormone levels to maintain homeostasis. Now, this pathway can also run opposite too. If there's too much, and I'll do this alternative reality in, in uh, let's see what color I haven't used yet. We'll do this alternative reality in purple. Let's say that circulating levels of calcium are too high. What's gonna happen is that's sensed, and then the integrating center would reduce parathyroid hormone secretion, we would have reduced catabolism of bone, we would have reduced levels of calcium levels. Sorry, reduced levels of calcium. So we're seeing that the pathway can be adjusted to maintain homeostasis. All right, right on. So now, next we are going to talk about the pituitary. Okay, everyone, so now we're going to talk about the proclaimed master glands. And we learned about in recent decades that this master gland really, even though it secretes a number of really important hormones, it actually is under control of a, a region of the brain called the hypothalamus. But this is going to be called the hypophysis. That is the proper name for it, but most people call it the pituitary called the master gland because it secretes a number of endocrine hormones. It's actually two glands as we'll talk about, but it is under the control of the hypothalamus. So I'm gonna go ahead and draw this. Brown's a good color for the, for the hypothalamus. We have the stalk here called the infundibulum, also known as the pituitary stalk. And now we're going to have the pituitary gland itself kind of looks like this. Okay, not really like, like that. Actually, let me try and draw it a little bit more. No, that isn't good either. Gosh darn it. Come on, come on, I can do this. All right, this is the last attempt. And it looks exactly like it did before, whatever. All right, so anyways, going to look a bit like this. And it's actually separated into two aspects. We have a posterior aspect and an anterior aspect. Uh, I didn't draw this true to size here. I'm gonna make one more, one more attempt at it. Here we go, this is, this is a little bit better. And this half here is going to be called the neuro, neuro for brain, hypophysis, also known as the posterior pituitary. posterior pituitary. And what this is, is it's actually an extension of brain tissue. So it's an extension of the hypothalamus. Sorry for squeezing that in, in here. It's actually going to support um, or secrete two hormones. What is going to be called um, antidiuretic hormone or ADH 
also known as vasopressin. And the other is going to be called um, oxytocin, which is the which is the uh, bonding hormone, as they call it. The adenohypophysis is going to secrete a much more wide range of uh, hormones. Just to just to to give you some examples of the ones we talk about in this course. Um, thyroid stimulating hormone, corticotropin stimulating hormone. Those are two of the main ones we're going to talk about. Luteinizing hormone, follicle stimulating hormone. So they have a number of uh, different effects on body tissues. All right, the other side, as I said, oh, and the neurohypophysis, let's go back there. It's not actually a true gland. What happens is that the hypothalamus is going to secrete hormones and then through, neuro, through um, neurons, it is actually going to secrete these, these, uh, these hormones. It is going to secrete it directly into the neurohypophysis. So it is more of a, um, it's more for storage than it is for secretion. It's not actually, synthesizing its own hormones. It's just is, is storing them. That is a neuron. However, the adenohypophysis, also known as the anterior pituitary, put this in parentheses, is going to be the anterior pituitary. What this is, is it is the true endocrine glands. It is the true glands. And it's going to secrete a number of hormones like I, like I mentioned earlier. Um, so, so when I say that it is the true gland, it actually has cells that are going to secrete various hormones. And it's very common for there to, well, not very common, but it's common enough for something to appear on a gland called a pituitary adenoma, which is either a very small or very large tumor. Well, large comparatively. The, the, the hypophysis is about the size of a pea. So if you have a, um, a lesion that's the side of a the very pointy part of a, of a pin, that's still going to be relatively sized. So if, if, if one of these, these hormone secreting cells gets damaged, it could result in things like thyroid dis dysfunction, sexual dysfunction, uh, excessive amounts of cortisol, insufficient amounts of cortisol. I did a lot of research on a condition called, called Cushing's disease, which is caused by over secretion of cortisol. All right, so the adenohypophysis is the true gland. The, neuro, the neurohypophysis is not, I guess it's kind of termed as the false gland, but that's, that's just because it doesn't synthesize its own hormone. On the study guide here, I, I put down that the adenohypophysis secretes something called, usually called, uh, tropic hormones. Usually, usually, there's, there's some exceptions here. So it creates tropic hormones. These are things that only have um, an effect on one gland, meaning that there's only one, one type of tissue, one specific location in the body that can receive this, this, this hormone. The rest ig ignore it, meaning that it tells a target organ or target tissue what to do. Um, so, we, so we call hormones 
many of the hormones secreted by the, the, uh, the adrenal hypophysis, we call many of them trophic hormones. And hormones released from the, the hypophysis, we tend to call these releasing hormones. Meaning that they tell the adrenal hypophysis what, what, what to release. Examples of this are corticotropin releasing hormone, but by, by roxins, um, by roxin releasing hormone, so on and so forth. Now, here's the thing, is that the hypothalamus is going to secrete hormone that is going to be received by the pituitary. Um, the most efficient way for that would be to secrete it directly to, uh, to the pituitary. It would, be very in a, it would be very inefficient to release hormone into the bloodstream, have it enter the general circulation system, only to be received by the pituitary. You need to release much larger amounts. So we're gonna talk about our first portal system this semester. It is a direct line of blood. It is a direct pathway between the, um, the, the, the hypothalamus. By the way, I just, I just caught this weird, this weird typo. Glad I caught it before someone emailed me about it and I had to eat crow again. All right, hypothalamus. So what's gonna happen is it's going to give the hypothalamus a direct pathway to send releasing hormones directly to the adenohypophysis. Because the adenohypophysis is just a ball of endocrine cells. And if the hypothalamus wants to, to communicate with it, it needs to send a hormone in the form of releasing hormones to be received by these cells. It doesn't have to do that with the neurohypophysis because it just has direct access via neurons. Okay, so we call this portal, we call it the, and I'll write this on the bottom so I don't crowd, the hypothalamic, pituitary portal system. And as I said, it creates a direct pathway for releasing hormones to, to be received by the cells of the pituitary. If somebody wants, if a doctor wants to detect the levels of a, of a releasing hormone, it's pretty hard. One way that they can do that is actually um, um, uh, it's a process called inferior petrosal sinus sampling is they can actually, uh, they can actually snake up a line that runs through the femoral vein all the way up to your, your jugular vein or petrosal sinuses and basically sample levels of a releasing hormone or even stimulate the releasing hormone. Yeah, it's a pretty interesting process. Inferior petrosal sinus sampling, if you wanted to check it out. Uh, what a, a portal system is, is, is it is basically a, a direct line of a of vessels from, kind of like a shortcut from one organ or tissue to the other. In the case of this one here, the, the, the hypothalamic pituitary portal system, it's a capillary bed, so it is incredibly small. Okay, so that is it for the, the, the hypophysis. As we talked about, there's two aspects of it. They're two separate glands. The true gland is the adenohypophysis because it can secrete, sorry, synthesize and secrete its own hormone. Doesn't do it on its own though. It must receive releasing hormones from the hypothalamus. The other aspect is called the neurohypophysis. And what, what that is, is also called the posterior pituitary, is going to receive and store hormones made in the hypothalamus. All right, so next we're going to talk about complex endocrine pathways. Be good times.
Okay, everyone, we are now going to be talking about the pathway for cortisol secretion. That's what is titled on the outline. If you want to follow along and draw with me, highly suggest you follow along and write, write with me. Why not? I mean, if you're going to be sitting here listening to this extremely entertaining lecture, might as well have just maximize your fun. So anyways, pathway for cortisol secretion. And I'm not going to be quite as fancy this time, but we're going to start with the stimulus. We'll just say that cortisol is going to be too high. So the stimulus is cortisol that's a little bit higher than the body would like it to be. It's a little bit above homeostatic levels. As we know, it's going to be received by the first integrating center, which is going to be the hypothalamus involved in the regulation of lots of different processes. Okay, so the hypothalamus is, is going to receive that the cortisol is too high and it's going to begin the first step in bringing it down. It is going to send a hormone called corticotropin releasing hormone or CRH. That's what it's ubiquitously called and that's what I'll be putting on exams and stuff. It's going to re reduce the amount of CRH secreted. The reason why is because it's going to be received, CRH is going to be received by the pituitary. And recall that the pituitary kind of views the hypothalamus as its, as its big brother that it looks up to. Um, whatever the hypothalamus does, the pituitary does in, in kind. So if it receives a lower levels of CRH, it's going to tell the pituitary to secrete lower levels of the tropic hormone adenocorticotropin hormone, or ACTH. And which will also be called ACTH in this, in this class. ACTH will be um, uh, secreted in less amounts. ACTH is going to be received by the third integrating center, and the third integrating center is going to be the adrenals. And the adrenals are the last step in the pathway because they secrete the active hormone, cortisol. In this case, since the adrenals are actually released or receiving a lower signal of ACTH, it's going to result in reduced cortisol secretion. And that is going to return the pathway to homeostasis. All right, great. However, this is what should happen. This is what happens most of the time until it doesn't. Because unfortunately, the, uh, the regulation of, of endocrine hormones is highly dependent on each tissue or organ doing its job correctly. If it doesn't, then we develop something called a pathology. Pathologies now. Now, there are generally two types of path pathologies, and that, is, and that is going to be either too much of a hormone secreted or too little of a, of a hormone secreted. So let's just go ahead and define them. Um, if we put hyper, for example, hypercortisolism, hyperthyroidism, is excessive amounts of hormone are secreted. And this is the result of a pathology. Now, when we put hypo in front of it, hypo means insufficient amounts of a hormone are secreted. Probably two well-known examples are hyperthyroidism, where the thyroid, where there's too much thyroid hormone. Person is generally very active. They, they lose their appetite. Um, they develop bulging eyes and other um, features. They start to lose their hair. 
And on the other side of it, we have hypothyroidism, which is caused by insufficient amounts of thyroid hormone. And of course, the symptoms are opposite of that. Lethargy, um, weight gain, um, feeling sad, uh, depressed, mood, um, poor, poor mood. And these are all, and these are both caused by pathologies. Uh, we're going to use the cortisol pathway because for, because for, for, for cortisol, uh, I guess I'm slightly biased toward that because I did a lot of, a, a lot of research, even at the National Institutes of Health, great experience, amazing campus. If you go to Maryland, highly suggest you, you, uh, at least drive by the, like, like by the campus, but, but, uh, what, what happens when there's too much cortisol secreted, there's a condition that happens called, called Cushing's disease or Cushing's syndrome. Uh, it doesn't matter. The symptoms are basically the same, but the difference between the syndrome and the, and the, the disease is the cause of it. So this is just a picture of somebody that has or a graphical representation of someone that has, has um, Cushing's. And if you look here, they have a very, very characteristic appearance. So they usually have very thin limbs, but their, but their weight is, set, is centered in their, in their torso. They also have um, accompanying um, things such as hyperglycemia, they also have, have hypertension. They develop stretch marks, sleep disorders, cognitive uh, difficulties, acne. So you, you see that the symptoms are very, are, are numerous because cortisol is received by so many cells in our, in our body. Um, we also have the hormone growth, growth hormone. We call that, um, Acromegaly, which I'll just go ahead and Google Andre the Giant, one of my favorite actors and athletes of all time. And one of my favorite pictures is Andre the Giant with Wilt and Arnold. And Arnold's a big man, by the way. Arnold's like six foot two at least. And if you look here, he's just dwarfed by Andre the Giant and Wilt. He looks like a, a kid. <laughs> Same with same with here here too. He looks like a, a kid, and this is a, and and as I said, Arnold is a humongous man. Um, Andre the Giant. Let's see. So he also has. I put down soda can. It's not a soda can. It's a beer can. His his drinking was legendary. He would drink up to like 120 beers at a at a sitting because he was just so, just so huge. Um, even though on, on TV, he came off as very affable. He was actually very depressed, but because of his size, very under, understandable. Um, one of my favorite stories is apparently he was at, um, a bar doing his favorite pastime drinking and, um, and oh, oh, by the way, this is a standard 12 ounce can, like the kind of can you would get from the vending machine. And it looks like a little toy in his hand. Anyways, he was at a bar drinking, which he, which he uh, was his right, and a group of uh, uh, patrons, a group, they started to make 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 fun of him. And after a while, he got sick of it, got up, started to charge towards him, and smartly they booked it into their truck, and apparently Andre the Giant tipped their truck over with them in it. Now keep in mind, this was probably back in the seventies or eighties when trucks were not quite as uh, heavy as they are now. But just, just think about it, in an, an enraged, gigantic man runs at your car and, and tips it over. That's just insane. So yeah, on the other hand, the opposite of acromegaly, which is growth hormone over secretion, we have um, dwarfism, which is a name that probably needs to be changed because it isn't, I don't know if it's the most, uh, polite term to use, but that is the, but that is the term used. And it's caused by growth hormone insufficiency, 
meaning that they don't receive enough growth, growth hormone. And this is just a picture. As you can see, there, um, there's there's not as much as much the, uh, development as far as limb length, um, so on and so forth. So, if it's, I I believe that they can give growth hormone uh, treatment if it is detected early enough. I I think, but it's not something that's that's in my realm of specialty as far as knowledge. Very, a very interesting stuff though. All right, so now we are going to go back here. And yes, I do watch a lot of anatomy physiology videos, helps to keep me up to date on things. So now we're going to talk about the types of pathologies. And to do so, I'm going to talk about the cortisol secretion pathway. Um, so I'm gonna start by drawing some of the some of the uh, some of the structures involved. So, I'm going to start with a with the hypothalamus, and then attached to the hypothalamus, as we know, there's a stall called the infundibulum. Then we have the pituitary. Give it a nice red, dark red color, very majestic. But then off to the side, I'm going to draw the adrenals here. So we have the kidneys. Top of the kidney is going to be a hat. And that hat is going to be the adrenals. So what's going to happen is that the, the hypothalamus is going to detect levels of cortisol. And the, the, the hypothalamus is going to, to communicate with the pituitary by releasing CRH through the hypothalamic portal system. And then when the pituitary receives that signal, it is going to release ACTH, which is going to be received by the adrenals, and then the uh, adrenals are going to secrete cortisol, which will be detected by, once again, the, the hypothalamus. So it is a feedback loop. So the first pathology we're going to talk about is called the primary pathology. So what a primary pathology is, is that the target organ, in this case, the ad adrenals are impacted in some, in some ways. Now, let's, let's go ahead and draw this pathway. I'll put here on the left how it should look. So this is how it should look. Um, Okay, so let's say that cortisol is too high. So that's the stimulus. What's going to happen is that it's going to result in, just for ease of sim simplicity, I'm just gonna draw, draw the hormones in general. CRH is going to be decreased. ACTH is going to be decreased. Then what's going to happen is that cortisol is going to be decreased. This is what would happen in a normal pathway. So in a primary pathology, what has, what has happened here is that there's a defect with the target organ. And here is how it would, would look. Let's say cortisol is too high. What's going to happen is it's going to um, be detected by the, the hypothalamus, of course, and then the hypothalamus is going to secrete CRH. And if cortisol is too high, 
it is going to reduce the amount of CRH secreted, all good so far. In, in turn, the pituitary is going to decrease its release of ACTH. Now what should happen is that the uh, adrenals should release this or should detect this decreased ACTH. And what they should do in kind is they should um, reduce uh, cortisol secretion, but it doesn't. It stays elevated. And that's because in a primary pathology where there is hypersecretion, I should add, add, add that in here, where there is hypersecretion, there is usually a tumor that is, that is made up of endocrine cells. It is a tumor. Usually these tumors are very slow, slow growing, but tumors can develop from endocrine glands. And as we know, is cells, is cells that divide outside of, 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 of regulation, dysfunctional cells. Yes, they work, but they don't work as well. And these cells are always stuck on the on position. So what happens is that they are outside of the negative feedback system, meaning that they don't, they don't follow it in instructions more or less. Because what's happening here is that the, the, the decreased levels of ACTH should be received by the adrenals and should reduce cortisol secretion. But it doesn't because the tumorous mass doesn't, doesn't listen and it's still going to continue to secrete excessive amounts of cortisol. And the same exact thing would happen if there was hyposecretion. If there was hyposecretion, it would be very similar, except the tumor would actually impede the function of the endocrine cells and more or less inhibit the adrenals from sec secreting the proper amounts of cortisol. If that was the case, how it would look like in a, um, in a, in a case of hyposecretion, I'll just write hyposecretion in red, so you know, it would be the opposite. Cortisol is too low, CRH goes up, ACTH goes up, and cortisol goes down. Now, how would the blood work look? Well, let's say you have some blood tests done, and I'm I'm going to make up numbers and and uh, and the uh, units, but just to to give you an idea. So, in a primary pathology, what they usually would do if they detect ab, ab or or if they detect that you might might have a disorder involving cortisol, is they would take two blood tests, ACTH, and urinary cortisol. So recall that ACTH is secreted by the pituitary and received by the uh, adrenals. Now in a primary pathology with hypersecretion, you would expect to see something like this for ACTH. You see something like 25.1 milligrams per deciliter. Recall this is all made up. And we'll say that the range is going to be eight to 16. And we would see for cortisol, we would see that it is extremely elevated. So we'll say 650 with a range of, of 120 to 210. So what, what, you would ex, what you would expect to see in a case of a, wait, sorry folks, I made a huge mistake here. Sorry, sorry, erase this. <clears throat> Apologies, all right, allow me to fix this. What I just showed you was the secondary pathology. All right, all right, all right professor, compose yourself. Okay, I'm good. ACTH would be extremely diminished. So instead you might see something like, um, like uh, 2.1 milligrams per, per, per deciliter. 
So what you would see is that ACTH would be below the reference range, but cortisol would be extremely elevated. Because what this tells the practitioner is that, all right, the pituitary is working fine. What it's trying to do is it is trying to tell the adrenals to secrete less cortisol, but it isn't listening. So in, so in turn, the, the amount of ACTH secreted is well, well below um, um, homeostatic levels. And that's because it's trying in vain, unfortunately, to get the adrenals to reduce the amount of cortisol. Kind of like when I, the first time I taught a middle school class and I told the class to stop talking and they didn't listen. So I kept telling them to stop talking. They did not listen. Then I realized that it was pointless and I sat down and I started crying. Not, outside, not on the outside, on the inside, and questioning my life decisions. And yeah, that's why I, uh, I'm pretty sure I would, I would rather get a root canal once a week for a year than teach another eighth grade class. Terrible experience. But that's a me, me problem. All right, yes, so you would expect to see ACTH uh, extremely diminished, but cortisol still going to be high. What about with a primary pathology where there is hyposecretion? Well, it's going to look like this. So I'm just gonna write it down here. So this is a primary with a hyposecretion. It would look like ACTH. We're gonna use the same, same reference range. Uh, if you were to guess that it would be elevated, you would be correct because the pituitary is going to try to raise cortisol back to homeostatic levels. But in a case of hyposecretion, it's going to look like this, it's going to look like maybe um, 72. So, what, so what's happening is that you would expect ACTH to be above homeostatic levels because it's trying, it's trying in vain to tell the adrenals, hey, come on, secrete more cortisol. We got to get the levels back within range. And the adrenals, for whatever reason, cannot react in kind. Which, by the way, with, with uh, cortisol secretion, um, 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 hyposecretion, especially with a primary cause, is relatively rare. It's usually going to be hypersecretion. All right, once again, with a primary pathology, the, the issue is with the target organ. The, the, the target tissue or target organ does not listen to the instructions from the pituitary. So it is still going to, it is, it is going to go against what the pituitary is telling it to, to, to do. If someone's going to have blood work done, um, if they have a primary pathology with hypersecretion, you'd expect there to be uh, extremely diminished ACTH levels, but extremely elevated cortisol levels because the pituitary is trying in vain to get the uh, adrenals to stop secreting so much cortisol. And with, with hyposecretion, you'd expect ACTH to be very high because it's trying to do the opposite. It's in vain trying to tell the cortisol or the adrenals to secrete more cortisol. All right. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go with a secondary pathology. Okay. And give me just a moment to erase things. Wouldn't that be great if uh, I could do this on a real um, board, real, real, real classroom board? That would be super fun. Just not to worry about using board cleaner and things like that. These are things that I think about a lot, even now. All right, so anyways, now we have a secondary pathology and the secondary pathology is a bit different because now the problem is not on the target organ or tissue. The problem is right on the pituitary itself. Can't draw the eraser, here we go. So there is usually a small tumorous mass called an adenoma. And with a secondary pathology, let's say that we're going to start with hypersecretion. We would expect to see cortisol too high, which means that 
the, the hypothalamus is going to receive the signal and it's going to respond by reducing CRH secretion. And the pituitary is going to receive that signal, but it's going to ignore it because this tumorous mass here is constantly secreting cord or is constantly secreting ACTH and is not listening to its instructions. So in a secondary pathology, ACTH is going to do above or it is going to do the opposite of what the hypothalamus tells it to do. The hypothalamus is telling it to reduce the amount of ACTH secreted, but as I said, tumorous masses act outside of negative feedback. It's not gonna listen. It's going to keep on pumping out excessive amounts of ACTH, and the result is going to be that you are going to have elevated levels of cortisol still. So we're seeing that the pathway has failed. It is not acting to re reduce the levels of, of, uh, of cortisol secretion. In a case of hyposecretion or, hypo or, or hypocortisolism, cortisol is too low, CRH would go up, but the same thing, the tumorous mass, in this case, in a case of hyposecretion, the tumorous mass would be impeding um, uh, pituitary function. So because of that, ACTH would be too low, cortisol would still be too low. Let's look at some, some blood work here. So secondary with, um, with hypersecretion, you would expect to see ACTH would be extremely elevated with a range of, I'll just say, 8 to 16. And as a result, is that cortisol would be very elevated. And that is going to be, um, I'll just say, 720, range of uh, 120 to 240. Usually, though, this was going to be a real example. Usually, secondary causes of hypercortisolism generally have a uh, even though the, 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 the levels of cortisol secretion are very high, uh, usually in primary pathologies, primary causes of uh, hypercortisolism, the levels can be much higher. Just a factoid for you. So we see that ACTH is high and cortisol is high. If these, if these both are, are elevated, is strong evidence toward a secondary pathology for hypercortisolism. Now, if we have the opposite, let's say we have a secondary cause where there is hyposecretion, ACTH would be like this. Um, 2.5. And then cortisol would be maybe 52. So it just depends on what this tumorous mass does. If it's secreting excessive amounts of hormone, you have hypercortisolism. If it's just a general mass and it's impeding the function of the cells that secrete ACTH, then it will be inhibitory. Uh, now the last one is very un uncommon and usually easily detectable because um, Generally, the only cause for it is going to be a very noticeable tumor on the, the hyperthalamus. And that's because we call this one, we call it a tertiary pathology. And tertiary pathologies involve a dis dysfunction in the, the hypothalamus, usually involving a tumor. And I'm going to draw this big because these things normally and first of all, let me just say that tertiary pathologies are extremely rare to the point where what, a, what an endocrinologist might do is, okay, they're gonna take um, your blood work. If it looks like it could be secondary, they'll have, they'll have you do a, a, uh, a brain MRI. And if it is tertiary, it will most likely show up as a very noticeable mass on the hypothalamus. But in this case here, the hyperthalamus is going to secrete either too much or too little cortisol, or sorry, CRH. 
So this is going to be a tertiary pathology. Tert tertiary, the level of dysfunction is at the hypothalamus. Um, and let's go ahead and draw this here. So this one is very hard to differentiate as far as blood work goes from a secondary pathology. So if we're, if we're going to go ahead and do hypersecretion, cortisol is too high, CRH will stay up, ACTH will stay up, cortisol will stay up. So in this case, um, negative feedback is still broken, but everything still follows the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is just being a very, um, a very terrible leader because the, because the actions of the pituitary and the actions of the adrenals are going to mirror that of the hypothalamus. If it's going to be a case of hyposecretion, then we're going to see the same thing, cortisol too low, CRH too low, ACTH too low, cortisol too low. So it just depends on the, on the cause and the result of, a, of whatever mass or damage is affecting the hypothalamus. And I probably shouldn't have, a, have erased the, the, the blood work aspect of it because you see something very similar. ACTH would be very high. Cortisol would be very high. And with, and with um, tertiary cause being, being, being hyposecretion, you would expect the opposite. You would expect um, low levels of ACTH and low levels of cortisol. So the blood work would be basically identical with a secondary pathology, with the only difference being that they would have to somehow find a way to differentiate uh, secondary and tertiary, usually pretty easy because as I said, tertiary is um, almost always going to be caused by a, by a tumorous mass. Um, there are, are, are many cases, unfortunately, where something has to be performed called a hypophysectomy. Uh, actually, let me, let, me, let me keep this up. I like this here, so let's erase all this, erase, erase. So there are times when the pathology itself cannot be found, or maybe they strongly suggest a secondary cause, but, but for whatever reason, it is not showing up on the, on the, uh, the MRI. So in that case, surgeons have kind of a, a difficult task. If all the blood work is showing that the, that the uh, cause is secondary, but it isn't showing up on the MRI, that's actually pretty common. So what, this, so what doctors like to do is say, okay, we don't wanna do anything yet because we wanna wait and see if it will become visible in the near future. Because if they're going to go in and, uh, and check the pituitary for a tumor, once they're in there, they're going to do something to it. If they see the mass, great, because of course the, the endoscope has a very tiny camera in it. And they usually go up intra uh, through the nasal passageway. If they're there and they see a tumorous mass, great. They have a little vacuum and they vacuum out the tumorous mass. You are gonna have some slight pituitary damage though because it is a very small, small gland and you are doing invasive things to it. However, if they do not see anything on it, what they might just do is say, okay, well, um, they could do, do testing to see which side, um, which side of the pituitary might, might be the cause of hypersecretion. Those, those take out that half. They'll just, they'll just cut that half and that's it. You'll, you'll still have um, decently normal endocrine function if, it, if, it, um, um, if the problem is fixed. The problem is not fixed you now have half a pituitary. So there are times and it's very rare where they might actually have to take out the whole thing. And that's something you really do not want to have happen because your life will be very impacted as you try and balance seven or seven different hormones that the pituitary is going to secrete. 
and it's a very it's going to be a very hard hard life so that's why surgeons in, in this case are very cautious about sending patients to surgery uh, so what a hypophysectomy is is a complete removal of of the of the gland So what would happen is that the, the hypothalamus in vain would constantly be sec secreting excessive amounts of CRH. So there would be excessive amounts of CRH because there'd be nothing to receive the, the CRH. And as a result is that cortisol would be, of course, nil. So what would have to happen is you would need a source of synthetic cortisol. And you would need to balance that out. I don't know exactly how it would work, but I would think that, um, yeah, it would be very hard to, hard to balance it because taking levels of CRH to kind of uh, measure if you're doing it correctly would be very hard. So yeah, and the hypophysectomy is complete removal of the of the of the glands. If I were to ask you on a quiz or a test, if, if someone has a hypophysectomy, what would you expect to happen to cortisol levels? Well, think about it. If the gland is gone, the cortisol is going to be gone because there's nothing to tell the adrenals to secrete it. Uh, one other thing we're going to talk about, especially because this has come into the news is a drug that's been around for a long time, an extremely potent um, syn synthetic cortisol um, drug. It is called dexamethasone. And it is a synthetic version of cortisol. It is actually 50 times more potent than hydrocortisol. Hydrocortisone. So what they assume, so their assumption, oh, and by the way, the, the hypothalamus cannot uh, differentiate between dexamethasone and naturally secreted uh, um, uh, cortisol. So the assumption is that tumors although defective, still maintain some negative feedback. Just their set point is much higher. So if you were to give a normal person dex, uh, dex of episode, which as I said, is a very potent drug. Normal pathology, if you were to give them dex of methasone, what would happen is that the, uh, the hypothalamus would detect extremely elevated levels of cortisol. And as you, you can imagine, it's going to start to freak out. CRH is going to be dramatically decreased, going to be received by the pituitary. ACTH would be dramatically decreased. And I'm, and I'm talking about to the points where um, where uh, it would be barely be detectable. And the adrenals are basically going to shut off their, their synthesis of cortisol. Doesn't mean the levels are going to come down, it just is going to turn it off. Now, what if you give someone a dexamethasone that has a secondary pathology? Well, as I said, we assume that tumors still have still maintain some negative feedback, just the set point is higher. So in a normal person with dexamethasone, their blood work would look like this. ACTH would look like, on a range of um, eight to 16, and cortisol, because blood tests can, can differentiate the two, cortisol would be, be something like, well, actually, I don't even think they, they, they uh, 
uh, they measure cortisol in the, the dexamethasone suppression test. They, they uh, just, just measure, measure ACTH. So what this, what this means is that the feedback system is normal in response to the extremely elevated levels of, of dexamethasone. The hypothalamus correctly told the pituitary to basically cut production of ACTH uh, to return cortisol levels to normal. By the way, this is a less than sign. Now, what about if you get someone with a pathology dex? So secondary. It's called a dexamethasone suppression test if, if you want to check it out online. What's going to happen is that their levels are going to look like this. So if it doesn't suppress, they get concerned. Now, this doesn't mean that if you were to walk into a, to a clinic and take dexamethasone and have your ACTH measured and have it say, okay, it's, it's too high, you have a tumor, so on and so forth. Um, no, you have, there, has to be sus, there has to be suspicion that you could have, have hypercortisolism. To give you an example, they did a dexamethasone test with endurance athletes and found that they, they did not suppress necessarily with dexamethasone. So research has shown that this test is not as, as reliable as they first thought but it still is used because it's been, it's been, uh, it's been published so much in, in literature. So if you are given a DEX test and, you, and, and, and there is not complete suppression, they usually get concerned because this, this number should be lower than zero, or sorry, not lower than zero, but just, but almost, um, almost undetectable. Uh, let's say that your ACTH, what if it is still um, like significantly elevated? What if this is, what if, if this is your result? Well, what they would then do is give you something called a high dose dex test. The low dose dex test is only one milligram. The high dose would be, I think, eight milligrams. And usually this will suppress everyone. But if it doesn't completely suppress uh, someone, then that is very clear cut that they have um, a secondary pathology for, for Cushing's. And you might be saying, well, why did they, they do the test to determine if it's a secondary pathology? Why don't they just do an MRI? And that's because MRIs are, especially for small things, are not nearly as, as reliable as you might think. Uh, there's a lot of false positives. There's a lot of shadows. There's there might be evidence of, but there is not. Um, but it is nothing that is necessarily um, something you would say. Okay, there it is. That's the tumor. I know that you probably are kind of tired of this by now, but I'm gonna show you now some. Um, some. Uh, Pituitary MRI adenoma, and you're also going to see why radiologists get paid so much money. So this is an MRI of somebody that has a pituitary adenoma, and what the assumption is is that all right. So first you are you are are going to give the patient you are are going to give them um, just, just an MRI and see, and see if there's, there's anything going on all with the pituitary. Uh, keep in mind, it's a very small gland. Uh, let me look up a, just a normal pituitary MRI. See, it's a very small, small gland. This is pretty, this looks pretty, pretty normal, pretty routine. Also this, this, this here, they do not, they do, you have multiple views. Uh, so I'm going to show you what it looks like if you have a pituitary MRI of what's called a microadenoma, which means that it's very small, like maybe the, the, the tip of a pin. 
And if you look here, um, tumorous masses, especially when, when given um, a contrast solution, they tend to take up contrast solution slower. So they tend to appear as little dark spots um, on the MRI. Sometimes it's very hard to tell though. Like if you look, if you look here, it's like, okay, well, you can kind of see something, but maybe nothing definable, right? Um, here's another one. So this, this one is fairly significant. As you can see, one side of the gland is going to be uh, larger. This one here, you're seeing that there's some slight uh, dis discoloration there, showing that that side of the gland is taking up uh, the contrast slower. But this doesn't really mean anything because these are not, these, this is more evidence of, it is not, okay, there's the tumor. But if it's called a macroadenoma, then the MRI becomes pretty important because that is pretty clear that, yep, this thing is definitely there. So you're seeing some images, these, these uh, macroadenomas as they're called, called are just huge masses. And those of course need to be removed surgically. All right, well everyone, I hope you enjoyed today's lecture. I really enjoyed talking about the, uh, the endocrine system. Hopefully you enjoyed it too. And shortly there will be chapter eight. Over and out.